Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. So today I wanted to talk about yoga, and I've been doing a little short series of talks on just some fundamental things about this tradition, about sadhana practice, uh, just beginning to get into the framework for how we practice and how we approach our everyday life. The word tantra means continuity, and it also means a text. Continuity in the sense that there's an unbrokenness about reality. Consciousness itself is unbroken. There are no gaps anywhere. And also there are no boundaries anywhere. So although you may be having an experience of being a distinct body, you actually aren't that. You are an aspect of this conscious reality having that experience. You're having a real experience of it, but that isn't actually what you are. If you are convinced through your embodied activity that you are a separate being, that you aren't living in continuity with all else, then what happens? Well, a whole nation living that way or a whole world that way can have really stupid ideas. Like you can dump millions of gallons of radioactive water into an ocean and not be affected by it because it's happening over there. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, cosmically speaking, we're just talking about down the block. Right? That's the same effect that we have in our lives, that something we do or feel is not affecting anything else, and that we are somehow these autonomous beings. We're having the same misconception that we're having nationally and globally. (laughs) That people are separate, that nations are separate, that oceans are separate. (laughs) So this fundamental experience of separation in this tradition is called anavamala. Anavamala. And it means the root ignorance. Tantra means the opposite of a navamala. It means continuity, discovering that there is nothing separating you from all of reality. And so when we do tantric sadhana or tantric practice, that's what we discover. We come out of our state of ignorance. We release that root ignorance called a navamala. And notice that I didn't say root sin because there's no concept of sin in this tradition. No concept of wrongdoing or sin or badness. We can simply be having a more limited experience or a less limited experience. And the more limited our experience is, the more separate we feel. So people who do other people great harm by being emotionally abusive or by being physically abusive or by slaughtering people, you know, what we call genocide, or by living in a way that is antisocial. What is wrong with those people? Are they bad? No. They're made of the same consciousness and energy as everybody else. They're continuous with us. They simply are experiencing grave ignorance. They are not in touch with their divine essence nature but they're made of the same exact stuff that we are. So that urge to eject bad people, you know, and call them non-human or inhuman is also 
a product of this anavamala of ignorance. If we were more enlightened, if the good people were more enlightened, if we were feeling our continuity with others more, we wouldn't throw criminals in jails. We wouldn't have any concept of punishment. Why would we punish anybody for being ignorant? We would need to protect people from those very ignorant people, but we would treat them as people who were very ignorant, not people who were bad and needed to be punished. So this feeling of separation has great repercussions in our lives. It makes us defensive and aggressive. It makes us divide people into categories that are very harmful. It makes us lose our sense of commonality with other creatures, animals, and plants, and with nature, with the elements, with other human beings. Everything that we see in our world that is harmful is a product of our feeling of separation. And far from it separating us good people from the bad people, it actually connects us. And when you begin to understand that in an embodied way, then great compassion for other people blooms. Right? When we're not busy protecting our little sense of self, we can feel great compassion and great sweetness and relaxation, even in the face of the horrible things in the world. Yoga means union. And most people know that. <laughs> On one level, it's indicating the same thing as the word Tantra. In other words, the, that everything is already in a state of union. But on another level, because it's a technique or a set of techniques, it indicates what we have to do to experience or re-experience that union. And what is it the union of? You know, this is the interesting thing when you go to a yoga studio and Someone says, you know, yoga means union, and everyone goes, ah, mm. <laughs> You know, but I'm always convinced that 99% of the people in the room have no idea what it, union with what. No one's ever answers that question. <laughs> so there's a, a couple major meanings of that. Uh, hatha yoga, which means the union of the sun and the moon. Now, the sun is a living symbol of prakasha, which is the light of consciousness, that, you, that continuous consciousness that's everywhere. The moon reflects the light of that sun. So the moon is a living symbol of all of this. We are all reflecting the light of that light of consciousness, like the child reflects the qualities of the parent. So the sun and the moon represents primordial consciousness and its reflection and its creation. The creation is the reflection. So the union of the sun and the moon means that after experiencing separation, as we do experience separation from that primordial light, from that primordial consciousness, they come together again or have an experience of coming together again. They don't really come together because they never were apart. But we have that experience of embarking on some kind of a journey or a path or a practice and then rediscovering and re-merging with essence nature. That's the experience that is at the core of our lives. So that yoga or hatha yoga, the union of the sun and the moon, means our journey, our journey of being reflections that feel very separate and coming back into a condition where we can experience that union. It also means the union of Shiva and Shakti, of that which has felt separate. And this is written in our bodies uh, because we experience Shakti being at the base of Muladhar Chakra and Shiva being at Agya Chakra and Shakti rising to meet and rejoin with Shiva. So this is the union of Shiva and Shakti, of reunion of the manifest with the unmanifest. 
or you could say the conditioned with the unconditioned. And again, it's talking about our practice, our process. The other way that you can think of this union of the sun and the moon is for those of you that are familiar with the anatomy of the energy body, which is the union of Ida and Pingala Nadi merging into the central channel. So in our bodies, we have a subtle body that's uh, more refined and it's sometimes called an energy body and it has subtle channels just like the meridians in Chinese medicine. And in the center, loosely in the middle of our spine is, is our central channel. And then on the left side, very close to it, is what's called Ida Nadi, and that's the moon. And then on the right side is Pingala Nadi, and that's the sun. And when you do enough practice, you have the experience of those two, the, the moon and the sun merging into the central channel. And then you have an experience of total unity, equanimity, uh, and samadhi, what, what is called samadhi. You go into the state called samadhi, which is a state of your awareness being aligned with the awareness. So you're still aware of being in a body, uh, uh, contrary to what some people say, um, but you're also, your awareness is now ubiquitous. You have that experience all at the same time. I have a question. Yeah. Like when I've usually heard Hatha Yoga, it's referred to like doing asana, like it's a style of mm -hmm. yoga, more mm -hmm. person yoga. So is, is there any relation? Yeah. I'm going to actually talk about that. So I'll get to that in, in a second. Cool. Yeah. Hatha Yoga comes out of a few different uh, teachers and was being written down at the same time that this tradition, Kashmir Shaivism, was entering into the texts, entering into scholarship. So we know this is, you know, between the 5th and the 12th centuries. We know that when a tradition of practice and an oral tradition of teachings gets written down, that's kind of a late stage, <laughs> right? That's when, you know, the upper crusties have finally noticed that something interesting is going on. <laughs> there are images, stone images and clay images of asana, of yogic postures, of seated meditation postures that we associate with yoga uh, that go back thousands of years. However, there are certain um, specific texts that codified what was called yoga before it hit this country. So I'm going I'm to get into that. Uh, during those 5th to the 12th century. And then in the 15th century, this came out of what's called the Nath tradition. The Nath tradition. It's actually pronounced Nath, but it's hard to say in English, um, which was actually a tantric kundalini yoga tradition. So originally, Hatha yoga was associated with tantric practices, with both internal asana and external. And then in the 15th century, there was a text written called the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which outlined a lot of the practices that form the basis for um, what in tantric lineages is considered to be yoga, not what we find to be yoga here in the United States. And that text included all of the practices of what in Tantra we consider to be yoga and in India what is considered to be yoga. So for the most part in India, there's a much more comprehensive idea of what yoga is that is still in an unbroken way coming out of the Nath tradition and the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. And that is that yoga includes asana, pranayama, the shat karmas, which I'll talk about in a second, and, and meditation. The shat karmas are 
uh, cleansing and purification techniques very much associated with Hatha Yoga coming out of the same tradition. Um, Nauli, which is like the churning of your abdomen, uh, swallowing rags internally to cleanse your intestines, uh, um, drinking lots of water and throwing it up again. What are some of the other ones? Um, um, oh yeah, um, Amaroli drinking urine. So there's like a a sort of standardized and not really very long list of what these shot karmas are, these cleansing activities. So these are all associated with hatha yoga or with yoga itself, not just asana practice. And still in India today, you know, it, Americans are kind of laughed at for only doing asana. Now the interesting thing is that the form of the forms of asana practice that we do here uh, are not mostly from India. Um, they are the product of a few different European teachers that came to the United States uh, a lot in the 19th century and early 20th century and kind of invented their own systems loosely based on something they knew about Indian systems. And there are a few good books that have come out recently about the importation and reception of yoga in the United States. So I think I have one of them or two of them on my Kindle and I just stopped reading them because I really wasn't that interested. But if anybody is interested, I'm happy to lend you those books. You can have a look. There were not nearly as many asanas in, and there are not nearly as many asanas as uh, there are in, in the U.S various systems of yoga. The way that asana is practiced in traditional tantric lineages or hatha yoga lineages or not yoga lineages is very, very different. The asana portion of those practices is usually considered to be preliminary. It's that you would undertake to do asana practice as kind of a gross form of later practices like pranayama and meditation. And that doing tons of asana throughout your life is not really how the practice was supposed to go. It's not that you wouldn't keep doing some asana to stay limber, but the idea that you would have this very intense asana practice and not graduate to more refined practices was really unheard of. So the, the idea was to get to the point where you could do kundalini yoga or kriya yoga, internal asana, where your experience was subtleized enough to do that and where you could meditate. Uh, and that was considered to be kind of the program that you went through, not only doing asana. The interesting thing about the Hatha Yoga Pradipika is that it, because it is a tantric um, text, it's very egalitarian in its way that it approaches gender. And it also um, has a chapter on uh, sexual ritual, which was later excised uh, from versions that hit the United States at first. And then there was a revived version of the Hatha Yoga Pradipika that was published by the Satyananda lineage uh, in the 20th century that reintroduced those chapters. Just an aside, not that it's that important. <laughs> so basically when yoga hit the US, the earlier practitioners of yoga here um, really were refashioning it as a kind of um, exercise, just the way that people do today and really stripped it of all of its roots in the spirituality of the tantric tradition. There was a lot of inner work that was associated with asana practice back then and still in, for instance, my Diksha lineage. But, you know, most of that got stripped out, like doing bandhas, doing mantra, doing visualization, working with chakras and inner channels while you're doing asana practice. Most of that just went by the wayside. And it's being, some of it is being reintroduced now. There's a more of an interest now in 
what the real spiritual roots of asana practice are. But by and large, there is still an across the board assumption that uh, if you're really into yoga, that a very heavy duty asana practice is what you're signing on for for the rest of your life. That's considered to be kind of the main event. And then, you know, you throw in a little pranayama now sometimes, and maybe you throw in 32 seconds of something someone calls meditation. Um, but there's still not nearly uh, the emphasis on asana practice as a gateway to waking up, to self-realizing. Right? I mean, it's claimed to have all other kinds of benefits, like lowering your blood pressure and making you relax and, you know, other kinds of things. But it's still largely divorced from where it came from originally, which was as a gateway to a tradition of self-realization. Now, if we are doing asana as an actual practice of yoga, and if we understand that yoga means union, and if we understand that it means union with everything, if, it, if we understand that it means something that could help us to realize our continuity with everything, something that could help us to recognize that we really aren't separate individuals, then it gets practiced in a whole different way. All of you, except for Phyllis, have taken the Tantra Foundations course. And what's, you know, we do those seven as asanas, and what's the biggest difference? Eyes open. Yeah, we do with our eyes open. And what else? And moving through space. Yeah, we're aware of where we are in space. We're feeling ourselves in our environment. We're, our eyes are open. We're actually trying to connect to feel a sense of connection rather than, you know, when you go to most yoga classes, people's eyes are closed and they're maybe even instructed to withdraw into themselves. Go in, go in, go in. Yeah. We're pretty much in all the time. <laughs> um, and I kind of have a theory about that. I don't know if it's right or not, but it, it sort of feels right to me, which is that, if, you know, if you've been to India, you realize how crowded and noisy it is and that everyone's externalized all the time. Everyone's always in a family, always working, always out on the street with a zillion people. And the only way that you can actually get any feeling of that's more subtle is by going inside, you know, and shutting everything out. So I kind of have this feeling that some of those techniques of withdrawal were actually much more appropriate and maybe are still more appropriate in India than they are here, where everyone's just like shut up in their iPod, right? We have so much solitude. We have so much space between us and other people. We have so many ways of shutting everything out. <laughs> uh, and for us to actually open and reach out is very, very important. So the, this is the way that I was taught to practice asana. And the way that I teach it, it's something that really develops over time, that ability to use asana to connect with things rather than to withdraw. So some of the things that um, are the hallmarks of the way that we do asana, although these aren't the detailed instructions that people get in the Tantra Foundations, are to open your senses, including your eyes, to be aware of what you're smelling and what you're feeling, uh, and to be aware of what you're seeing, to open all of those senses out into the environment. And then one thing, another thing that's very, very important is to feel and enjoy your body in space, to be aware of how you're being touched by the space around you, and to uh, instill a feeling of dance and of grace in your practice, no matter what kind of asana practice you're doing. Abiding for a moment after each asana is completed and just feeling the vitality of it, feeling 
the mood of it, feeling whatever impact of it you can. And that abiding can be done in between the poses. So when you've already come out of the pose, of course you want to be feeling those things when you're in the pose, but you also want to be feeling them when you're no longer in any asana. You want to feel the effects on you. Another thing that's important is to allow yourself to explore the pose while you're in it and not be rigid. So in this practice of yoga that I teach, getting into a perfect pose, first of all, there is not really any idea of perfection because perfection is what you experience when you are doing yoga. It's not the pose that you are in. If you're having the right attitude while you're doing it, then you can experience the perfection of everything. And it isn't the perfection of your pose, <laughs> which will never be perfect in ordinary terms, right. at least not for most of us. So it's really important to feel around in the pose, to feel for the experience of it and to be able to actually move in the pose. This doesn't mean vinyasa, it doesn't mean moving quickly, it means being free, letting yourself make adjustments, letting yourself explore by moving out in different ways in a small, you know, small movements. Uh, and not being afraid to let your body just do what it wants to do in the pose. So you can feel the effects of that and experience freedom. A nice way to do that for those of you that actually have been doing this practice is to let your awareness rest in your central channel while you're doing asana. We're really trying to explore what it means to be human and what are the capacities of a human being. Asana is one way to do that. Asana facilitates the opening of the channels, so that means it facilitates a larger view having a possibility to have a larger view in any particular moment, to experience more capacity as a human being, to experience more of a sense of equanimity and playfulness and liveliness. So those things are much more important than the physicality of the pose. You can stand in Tadasana, which is simply just standing with your feet parallel and your hands down, and being in open gate posture and have a more profound experience than doing some fancy other pose. If you're in the right bhav, if you're able to work with that and allow yourself to go into the spaciousness inside and outside and connect those two things. Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.